When it comes to the federal level, we have a few champions. And those champions are on the right side of history. And Congresswoman Barbara Lee is one of those champions. Her commitment to doing what's right in Congress started in 1998. She started with earning her master's in social work from UC Berkeley, and then founded the Community Health Alliance for Neighborhood Growth and Education, which provided mental health services to many of the East Bay's most vulnerable individuals. She was the sole representative who voted against the authorization for the use of military force in the wake of 9-11. And did you know that as of 2013, this authorization has been used more than 30 times to engage in military action without congressional oversight? And she continues to work to repeal this blank check and restore Congress's constitutional oversight on matters of war and peace. She was an outspoken opponent of the Iraq war. And she stood on the right side of history when it came to the Muslim ban. And now she's speaking up for us again. She's speaking up for the Palestinians. She's speaking up for a ceasefire. And she's one of those people that I support, that I have followed, that I am proud to be able to introduce today. Because I've seen the face of our Congress folks in my very own district, I've seen the face of a Congresswoman that does not respond, that shuts her door, that basically makes us invisible. And so tonight, I'm honored to introduce and welcome our next US Senator, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Mayor Khan, thank you for your um, gracious introduction, but also for your tremendous and bold leadership. And I just want to say to her um, how she has come for such a time as this. And I am humbled by her support. Where is Mayor Khan? Is she still? Where? But I just want to say to her uh, how much I appreciate her and her friendship also. So I'm honored to be with you this evening. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. To Mr. Al uh, Marhiyati. Did I get it? <laughs> Mr. Al Marhiyati. <laughs> and the Muslim Peace, uh, excuse me, Public Affairs Council. I just want to say to you uh, how incredibly I'm grateful for your strength and your advocacy and fortitude in pursuing groundbreaking public policy for the American Muslim family. Um, you are really authentic uh, voices for principal change, and that's what we need right now. So thank you again for inviting me to speak with you. Now, in a moment when basic facts, as you know, are about our nation are under attack and history is under threat of being rewritten, let me just revisit some core truths about how America quickly was built. Muslims have been a part of this country's fight for freedom before this country even had a name. I know that. We've got to teach more of that in our schools. During the American Revolution, Muslim names appear on those military muster rolls. Muslims who fought and died to realize our Declaration of Independence to make it more than just words on paper. 
I also believe that the security and prosperity of the American people is connected to the security and prosperity of others, wherever we are. Our planet, and you know this, our planet is very small, and we are all part of the human family. An effective United States foreign policy should seek to build partnerships, not just between governments, but between peoples. A sensible and effective foreign policy recognizes that our safety and welfare is bound up with the safety and welfare of others around the world. Now, Mayor Khan, she mentioned the 2001 authorization of military force, which did launch the global war on terror. And it was overly broad. It gave President Bush and future presidents to the authority to go to war without coming to Congress. It set the framework for forever wars. Now, I take no pleasure in pointing out that I was the only member of the House or Senate who voted no. You know, <laughs> the global war on terror was, is a strategic, economic, and humanitarian disaster for our country and the world. It is, and you know this. Nearly half a million civilians were killed, not to mention the hundreds of thousands of refugees displaced from their homes. Thousands of American troops lost their lives. Tens of thousands come home wounded in body and spirit from a war we should have never started. Muslim, Christian, Jews, non-believers. This war cost trillions of dollars, money that could have been spent on rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure right here at home, education, health care, environmental protection. And yes, these wars created ISIS and other terrorist groups that had not existed before. You know that. I know that. And so after a month, after I cast that first lonely boat, I slowly built a coalition to warn my colleagues of what was coming next. 65 of my colleagues in the House and one friend in the Senate joined me to vote against the Patriot Act, which empowered the government to spy on its own citizens and led to unlawful imprisonment of Americans. And I knew even then that Muslims in this country would bear the brunt of that expansive surveillance. So I kept fighting back. By Octo October of 2002, 132 of my colleagues in the House and 23 in the Senate, Republican, Democrats, and Independents, joined me to vote against the authorization for use of military force against the Iraq resolution. Now, I knew that there were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. So did most members of Congress. But that authorization passed, and I actually tried to stop it by saying, look, let the IAEA conduct these inspections and hold up until we know the results. I got 72 votes on that amendment. But fast forward, we know what they saw and produced and reported. There were no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But yet, we did go to war and lost so many people, lost so many lives, so many refugees. Finally, members of Congress saw what I saw, that giving any president the authority to engage in forever wars created the justification to use force anywhere for any reason in the world. Using this authorization, President Obama, who I supported over and over and over again, I was one of the first members of Congress to endorse him, but he used that authorization in Libya, which I publicly opposed. Three presidents have come and gone since Congress last voted to authorize the U.S. invasion of Iraq over 20 years ago. A fourth is now in office. But the legacy of these horrific wars li lives on, and so does the fact that we cannot remain bystanders, as you know. 
Our responsibility as Americans, as human beings, as leaders on the global stage is to pursue a foreign policy which focuses on human rights, diplomacy, peace, and security. That is what our foreign policy should entail. And this is precisely why this year I introduced bipartisan legislation to repeal the 1991 and 2002 authorizations for the use of military force and formally, mind you, and this is not formally completed yet, ending the Gulf and Iraq wars. Can you imagine that? So it's past time to put decisions about military action back into the hands of legislators as the Constitution intended because we, above all, are responsible to the people we serve. And the American people have been very clear. They do not support endless wars. They do not support the slaughter of civilians. And the voices of Muslims now more than ever is badly needed. Now, for those of you who don't know me, and I serve on the, I was on the Foreign Affairs Committee for 11 years now. I'm on the Appropriations Committee, the subcommittee, and I chaired when Democrats were in the majority. Now I'm the ranking member, chairing the committee that provides all of the humanitarian assistance, development, diplomacy, famine relief, embassy security, you name it. That's under our jurisdiction, my jurisdiction. I have been to Gaza. I have visited Ramallah in the West Bank. I've been in uh, Lebanon, in Beirut, in Sidon, in Tyre, in the refugee camps. And so I am deeply sad and concerned about what is taking place in Gaza right now, which is why I joined 55 of my colleagues in urging the United States to protect innocent civilians and ensure the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Almost. <laughs> That's the least we can do, the least we can do. And so I've negotiated, it's not enough, but we're close in terms of approximately 11 billion for the world. But almost a month ago, and yes, I did call for an immediate ceasefire to save civilian lives. That was a month ago. This is... Again, as a person of faith in the book of Esther, um, we have come for such a time as this, my brothers and sisters. Almost a month ago, um, I was so outraged, like I know all of you were, by the horrific terror attacks carried out by Hamas against Israeli civilians. More than 1,400 people were murdered, and I have unequivocally condemned these brutal, atrocious attacks. I have been similarly devastated by the rising civilian death toll in Gaza. Now, more than 11,000 people have been killed in one month, far too many of them children. It is unacceptable. This violence must stop. So let me be clear. My call for a ceasefire, again, this was a month ago. It should not be mistaken as a lack of support for the protection of the people of Israel. To the contrary, it's because of my dedication to the safety and life of everyone, Palestinians and Israelis, every human being on this earth, that I am determined to work to seek a path forward without further escalating the toll of civilian dead and injured. This moment calls for moral and strategic courage. Only a cessation of hostilities will allow for the negotiations and the immediate and safe return of all hostages and the delivery of essential humanitarian aid. Because as history shows us, open-ended wars do not make for good foreign policy nor will they deliver peace and security and justice for the people. And I am worried about where this ends and what happens at the end of what is taking place now. What next? The United States, yes, I think we need to help lead the way now. And I urge President Biden to put greater effort into negotiating a ceasefire. Because neither Palestinians 
Palestine, nor Israel, Israelis will be free until they enjoy real and lasting peace, justice, security, and freedom. And I'm not just talking about freedom from violence. I'm talking about freedom from disease. We see what's taking place now with the injured and what's taking place as a result of the crushing infrastructure in Gaza. Freedom from poverty, freedom from thirst and hunger, freedom from environmental disasters. That's what freedom is about. Because none of us are free if we have nowhere to call home. What is gonna happen with all of our Palestinians who don't have a home right now? None of us are free if we can't afford to feed our children. Our very humanity is grounded in freedom of movement, freedom to learn, freedom to worship whatever God we hold dear, and the freedom to not worship, if that is what one wants. But those freedoms that we hold dear are also under attack here at home. I remember when Donald Trump <laughs> was in office and put forth the Muslim ban. Well, as a member of the House Appropriations Committee, I offered the amendment to defund the Muslim ban. That was, there was no way I would let that go. As President Eisenhower said, he said that every gun, now he was a Republican president, but he said that every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies a theft from those who hunger, who are hungry and who are not fed, and those who are cold and not clothed. This world is in arms, and it's not spending money alone, it's spending money on armor, armaments. It's spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, and the hopes of its children, both here in America and in Gaza and in Ramallah. At the exact same time that, yeah, my Republican colleagues continue to vote to substantially increase military spending, they also want to cut, both here at home and abroad, education, environmental protection, and the needs of children and seniors. That's wrong. If we continue to extol the virtues of freedom and justice abroad and be taken seriously, Yes, we need to practice those values here at home. That means continuing the struggle to end racism and sexism and white supremacy, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, all forms of hate. As a black woman, I know what hate is. I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas. I know what hate is. We've got to make it clear that when people march on our streets as neo-Nazis, fascists, or white supremacists, we have no ambiguity in condemning everything that they stand for. If we continue to argue that poverty should be eradicated in developing nations around the world, we must fight tirelessly for Americans to have the economic freedom to stay in the hospital without the fear of bankruptcy, to send their children to college without being crushed by the burden of debt. Every person on this planet shares a common humanity. We all want our children to grow up healthy, to have a good education, to have decent jobs, drink clean water, breathe clean air, and live in peace. That's what Palestinian children want and deserve. That's what American children want and deserve. As one of our black Muslim leaders, Malcolm X, who I never had a chance to meet, but you know Malcolm X. But I did get to know his wife, Dr. Betty Shabazz, and I'm friendly and friends with the rest of his family as well as we speak. Malcolm said, you cannot separate peace from freedom because no one can have peace unless he or she has his or her freedom. And so 
That is Malcolm X in the day. And so I know that together we can build a future of freedom and peace and security together. Thank you again so much for your leadership. May God bless you.